Um, what can I say about Peter? Um, he's a... Uh, you know what? You gave me no warning this time. Are we supposed to be ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Waiting on Richter. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, again, uh, I, I don't know what's today about Peter that hasn't already been said. Um, the man is a pioneer uh, in big footing, uh, a worldwide adventurer. Great white hunter and my good friend Peter Burke. Yeah! Woo! Good, e good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to be here again and see so many friendly faces. Let's hope they're all still friendly by the time I stop talking. <laughs> um, I'm not giving a talk. I think. Um, Todd was supposed to say that. He did. Because uh, we did, right. Because I really have nothing new to offer. No new findings. Uh, nothing original. And so uh, what I proposed to Todd was a question and answer session. So that's what this is. It's a Q&A. Probably 30 minutes if we go on that long. And I'm happy to answer any question I can answer. I've been in this thing now 55 years. And so I know something about it. I am not an expert. There are no experts. To me, an expert is somebody who has nothing more to learn. So I'm still an amateur, if you like, trying to understand the mystery. I've never seen one, never heard one. Anyway, let's start with questions. I'm happy to answer any reasonable question that I'm able to. Just a comment. Could you hold the mic just a little closer that they can't do that? Right. Okay. There's a huge difference between here and here. Okay. Uh, is that better right now? Is that good? I came into the Bigfoot search in uh, 1960. Before that, I'd been in the Himalaya for three years looking for the Yeti. And the people who sponsored me in the Himalaya, after three years, they said, You've been up there long enough. Would you like to come to the United States and help us find a Bigfoot? And that's how I came over here. These were Texan sponsors in Texas, a man called Tom Slick. So that's when I got into it. And I've been into it, or in and out of it, ever since. Oh, question. Aside from Albert Osprey, can you share any early abduction stories? Stories about Sasquatch abducting people? I think there'd be two in, in my um, the question is stories of abduction by Sasquatch. That's the question. And uh, I think there are two. One is Albert Osborne, um, who said he was um, picked up and carried off by a Sasquatch. Um, this is somewhere in the Butte Inlet area in British Columbia. And the thing kept him in an amphitheater of rock where there was a family living. Kept him there for three or four days. And then he managed to escape. And uh, he ran and walked for 30 or 40 miles. Came into a logging camp. That's his story. And people who have interviewed him, including John Green, uh, believe his story to be quite authentic. And the other one was um, uh, um, a Native American um, on um, Vancouver Island, and, um, his name was Butchelet Harry, and he lived in um, a small religious community 
and he was a hunter and a fisherman. So he took off in his canoe and he went all the way up the coast and came into the um, Kanuma River Inlet, left his canoe there and walked in another 10 miles or so with his rifle and his traps and uh, spent the night. And in the night he was wrapped in his blankets. Something came, grabbed him, picked him up and started to carry him off. And I forget what he did. I think the thing put him down for a few minutes. He said, let him go. So he ran, ran all the way back down to the inlet, got in his canoe, paddled 45 miles. And at about three or four in the morning, they heard him shouting. And there was a father, Anthony Terhar, who was one of the priests there, went down to the water, helped him ashore. He was dressed in his underwear. He was freezing. So he recovered. But I, I interviewed uh, Terhar, and he said uh, a couple of interesting things. One, that it, within 10 days his hair went completely white. And the other thing is that he never went back for his rifle or his traps. He never went to the woods again. So the answer, to answer the question about abductions, those are the two that I know about. There may be more. Yeah, yes, sir. What is your assessment of the Vince Dewar photograph from down in Southern Florida? Uh, the, the, I'm sorry. What is Vince that? Dewar, the fire chief down near Ochopee, Florida. Uh, a photograph you're talking about? The, the skunk ape photo from 1997 taken by the fire. Oh, you're talking about the skunk ape? The Shawanoki, yes. I, um, I don't know what to make of it. I think there might have been something there at one time because. Um, Native Americans in that area had a name. They called it the Shawanoki, which I think means big hairy man, big man. So there may have been something there one time. As of now, I don't know if there's anything there. I was there for a month. I made a short documentary. Um, but that's, that's, that's all the research I did. I didn't do much more than that. Right. So it's a great mystery, as we all know. I've written um, three books now. And um, I've been in it, met a lot of people. The people I find most convincing are the eyewitnesses. And I've interviewed state policemen, engineers, surveyors, all real down to earth people who had eyewitness incidents and have told me about them. And that's part of my belief in the thing, which makes me think that there is something there, or that there might have been something there. Because right now we have a very strange gap. And I talk about sightings, and I talk about credible sightings. And to me, a credible sighting is one where the eyewitness has been interviewed thoroughly, he's filled in a questionnaire. And as of now, in my research, which is not full time, the last sighting that I and my companions, my associates, have is January 2005. So we have a huge gap which goes into 11 years where, in my research and my opinion, there hasn't been a single credible sighting. I don't know what the reason is. So it's rather strange, rather ominous. Yes? Um, you talk about Native Americans. Do you put credence in their traditional stories that Bigfoot is uh, real and has always been in, within their culture? Do I put do I put credence in what? Their stories about yeah. big their in their culture? Beliefs. Yes, yes, of course I do, yes. I think there's something like that we know of about 15 different Native American names for the Sasquatch Bigfoot among the tribes of the Pacific Northwest. Just in the Pacific Northwest or throughout North America? Now here we may have a difference of opinion because my research suggests that these things have lived and may live and have habitat west of the Rockies only. So they may be in Kansas, they may be in Kentucky, they may be in Texas, I don't know. My research hasn't really gone that far. But what I see is habitat west of the Rockies only. Yes, sir. Um. You've uh, been doing this for 55 years. You must have amassed a great uh, multitude of data, reports, stories, papers, 
uh, all types of uh, information that you must have collected. Uh, what what is to become of, of all of that? Have, are you do you have plans to archive that in any way? Um, yes, I do, and um, they're not uh, concrete at this time. But I have quite a bit of material. Um, much of what I've done in my research is in my books. So at this time, my materials, my memorabilia, call it what you like, is um, uh, sitting waiting for something to happen to it, shall we say. It needs to be in a museum. Yes. No, I think I need to be in a museum. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Your research. Your collection. Well, there's a lot of stuff, and I've collected quite a bit of it. Are you, do, do you have yeah. your hand up there? Uh, yes, go what, ahead. What got you started in your research? Yeti, Bigfoot, where did you first start doing your research? Well, on the, on the Yeti, um, I worked with a tea company up in North India, and we were allowed one month's vacation every year. So over the course of five years, I spent I took three trips into the Himalaya with small expeditions of one month each, going into different areas, uh, talking to people about the Yeti. So that's where I began, because I lived in India, I lived under the Himalayas, and then I've been hearing about it since I was a child. So one of, the, one of the great pieces of evidence, in my opinion, is, is the Patterson Gimlin uh, footage, 1967. Um, we all know about it. Um, lots of people have tried to dis disprove it. I spent a lot of time, and in my last project in the 90s, we spent uh, $85,000 having it analyzed by a company in, um, I think it was in Boston. And the consensus of opinion on that is that it's real and that uh, the creature you see in that footage is in that footage is a real living creature. It's very short, it's not a very good piece of footage, but it is extraordinary. And if you're lucky enough to see good stills, you can see an ear, you can see two teeth in the mouth here, and you can see um, a thumbnail when the thing turns around like this. So if it's a man in a costume, it's is incredibly well made. We don't think it is, we think it's real. So part of the stuff that keeps me going on Bigfoot that started, the evidence, if you like, is footprints, the 67 footage, uh, the history, and uh, eyewitness reports, those four things. My goodness, I'd have to think of a question myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Of the experiences that you've heard, which one do you like to share? Of the experiences that I've heard about, yeah. which one? Do you like to share most often to people? Um, there's, there's a number. Um, of, you're talking about eyewitness reports and interviews. There's a number. There's a state policeman living in Bend. His name is Harris. I heard that he'd seen one. He didn't want to talk to his, anybody. He talked to his wife. He talked to another state policeman. He talked to somebody who talked to me. So I called him and told him I was a writer and very sincere and I would like to talk to him and he said I'm not talking to you, go away <laughs> and there was a silence so I said I'm sorry sir, I apologize, I didn't want to bother you I just heard you're deciding I'd love to talk to you and he said call me back in a year huh. so I called him back a year later and he had retired and he said come and see me so I went to see him in Ben and we went to the place where he had his sighting and he was coming up the, um, the road that runs out of Madras North, I'm not sure, maybe 395. And there's a cutoff, they call it the Dufa Cutoff. And he was with the state police, and I think he was with the, um, their forestry department. So cruising at night, looking for poachers, looking for timber theft, he came over a hill, and this thing was standing on the side of the road. And he slowed down, and the headlights went full onto it, and he, um, saw it very clearly and it immediately started to cross the road in front of him. 
walked across in his headlights. So he slowed right down and he didn't look at the headlights. He went up a bank and then he, um, he said, I'll never forgive myself for what I did. He put his foot on the throttle, he panicked. He had a shotgun, he had a pistol, he had a steel car, he panicked. He drove away and he said this odor came in the window, this powerful odor. So he went back next morning and uh, with another state policeman and there were footprints in the bank there. So that's one of the many interviews I've done which I found very, very convincing. And uh, I've been involved in a Canadian documentary called The Sasquatch Odyssey. And that story is the, in, in that movie, in that feature. We went, we went back there with him and did an interview on the spot. So that was one of my more interesting <coughs> interviews to answer your question. So. Yes? I'm just wondering, with all the experiences and stuff in remote areas and, and uh, uh, from India to, to Northern California, to the Pacific Northwest and everything, with all your encounters and what, in relation to Bigfoot, what was your most maybe scariest moment? Scariest. <laughs> scariest moment. Scariest moment. Don't say me. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, um, no such thing. I've never had a scary moment. Really? No, never. No. I, um, I've spent a lot of time in the woods. I enjoyed the woods and um, learned something about the animals and the birds. Nothing to be scared of out there at all. So I've never had a scary moment. No. No. <laughs> I had an incident though, and I'll tell you about it because it's something I don't understand. This is about 1975, as far as I remember. And there was a double sighting. There was a sighting by two men on a Thursday in this area, which was Pearl Mountain above the Blue River Valley. There was a sighting on a Friday by two men in the same place, seeing this thing standing watching them. And I got the information late Friday night. I got it very quickly. I was very lucky. So I was there on the Saturday on my own and I had to make a decision whether I tramp around and look and try and find something. And uh, I decided that if this thing was watching these men working and what they were doing is they were using a small tractor and they were stacking wood for burning. So if it was watching them and I camped there, it might come out and watch me or it might take an interest in me. So there was a clear cut with a wall of forest all around and um, probably 500 yards by 500 yards. So I, I put a small tent right in the center, a little red tent. I lit a fire. I had something to eat, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. And by about 8.30 it was dark. And I decided to turn in when I heard a stick crack. It was a tremendous crack. It was a large stick crack like this. And I heard it again, out of this black wall of the forest. If I'd had a, um, some kind of night vision device, I would have seen something. And it went all around me for an hour, a person or a Bigfoot or something, cracking these great big sticks, literally, literally with its hands. It wasn't something crunching, it wasn't an elk, it wasn't a bear. It went all the way around in one hour. And after one hour, the cracking stopped. So I sat up for two or three more hours. I had binoculars, but I couldn't see into the forest. And then I went to sleep. Next day, some friends came up. We searched the area. We didn't find anything. So your explanation of that is as good as mine. I don't know what it was. And that's the only thing that I've been saying. You didn't find broken branches? No, there's a, the, 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 the forest is full of debris. Tons of debris. Broken branches, broken trees. And then in the clear cut itself, lots of broken stuff. We, we went out there to search. We crunched through the stuff. But these were big, big sticks being broken by something. Possibly something with hands. So, and that's the only incident I've ever had, which was it a big thing, I don't know. It could have been. That's all I can say. So. In your career in this, how many tracks have you found and what was the difference? Uh, but, um, how many sets of footprints? Uh, five, five sets altogether. Four sets in Northern California and when I was running the project there in 1960 and 61 into 62, we found four sets of footprints at that time. And there were two sizes, 14 and a half inches and 16 inches. 
and then years later, up about the Hill River Valley, after a sighting, I found two or three footprints on the side of the road going up a bank. So five sets across all this time of what I think were genuine Bigfoot footprints. Yes, ma'am. So, do you believe in Bigfoot? Is it real? I'm sorry, what's the question? Do you believe in Bigfoot? Is it real? Do I believe in it? Yes. Absolutely, yes. As I started, when I started to talk here, I said, I think, um, 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 I believe that they were there. This is possibly, there's still something there. But now we have this strange gap in sightings. Ten years, going into 15 years. So I, do I believe in it? Yes. From the eyewitness reports, the people I've interviewed, the Patterson film, the Native American law, the history, and, um, and the footprints. I guess I believe that there was something there. Whether there still is or not right now, I don't know. And nobody else knows. It's like asking me, how many do you think there are? There's one, <coughs> or there's a thousand. Nobody knows how many there are at this time. So, that's it. Yes, sir? What advice would you give researchers today? Don't give up. The question is, what advice would I give researchers today? I think it's um, fascinating. I think um, use as much technology as possible. Do as much reading as possible. Do your research in areas where there have been credible sightings, areas that would support a number of these things. I'd say stay west of the Rockies, and that's the advice I would give a researcher at this time. So. Yes, would you? Yes, sir. Throughout your career, what's your highest and lowest moment? Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, what's my highest and my lowest moment? It's a hard, very difficult question to answer. There's been no highs. I mean, it's been great fun working with people, finding footprints, interviewing people. Uh, lots of highs. It's been a great experience. I've been very fortunate to be able to get into it, to be invited over to this country. I've never been here before. When I came here as a complete novice, I came as a tourist, got a green card, and eventually got citizenship. Lows? I don't have any lows. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's it going to take to prove the existence of this creature? A simple answer to that body, a body, a dead body. And I sincerely hope that um, I think there's a possibility of a body being found. I would love that to happen of something that had died of natural causes, not something that had been shot. Scientists, science demands a body on the table, not footage or still photographs. Not 20 people seeing one, it's all unacceptable. They demand a body on the table. And then science will accept it. And it could happen. The problem is, in the Northwest here, is there's an incredible uh, disposal system out there. Something dies, and it's eaten very, very quickly. The minute a body be, um, uh, begins to decompose, it sends out odors. A bear can pick up the odors of a decaying carcass from a quarter of a mile. Maybe even film that, maybe a much a half a mile if the wind is right. Then in come the bears, crows, ravens, uh, uh, porcupines, coyotes, and within a short space of time, the body's gone. In Africa, in 48 hours, he's completely disappeared, gone. And there's nothing on the ground but black marks. First come the vultures, hundreds. Then come the um, marabou stalks, magpies, carrion eating birds. Eventually, there's nothing left of any of the tissue but just the great big bones. And the bones are enormous. And the hyena come in and they crunch those bones up, elephant leg bones. They crunch them up and swallow them in chunks. Eventually, there's nothing at all left but the teeth and the toenails and the ivory, and those are eaten by porcupines. So Africa has a perfect system, and we have the same system here. So finding a body, good luck. <laughs> Get there quickly. Yes, ma'am. What, what's your uh, best yeah. theory on what you think Bigfoot is? What do I think it is? What do I think Bigfoot is? Yes. Well, it's a large primate. Um, it could be a hominid, in other words, human form. It could be a hominoid, ape form. We know almost nothing. 
The only, the only real pictures we have of the Benson film, in my, um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are no stills after all this time. So we don't know what it is. It's done by walking, it's bipedal, it's large, it's hair covered. People have seen one up close and said to me, strangely human face, that face looked human, didn't look like a gorilla or an ape, looked like a human being to me. So that's the possibility of it being a hominid. Apart from that, uh, Ronnie, I don't know any more than that. Yes, sir. Bill, building on that question, are you still vehemently opposed to killing one? Yes, I'm opposed to killing one. I'm opposed to the idea of shooting one. I don't think it would be justified, especially as it could be the last one. Well, um, I've just uh, completed another book. I have a copy here, which is a gift for Todd and Diane, our great hosts. And I think I'll conclude now, because we have somebody coming after me, and that's Ron Moore who is a very good speaker and a good friend of mine. So I would like to um, uh, just ask for a vote of thanks for, for Todd and, and Diane. Yeah! Another, another hand for Peter Byrne. Yeah! Woo All right, I am going to... Where's Cindy? Cindy, a little more time? We can do a real quick auction, maybe two or three items. The lighting is getting just about right.